Um, well, uh, hello everybody. Uh, uh, thanks a lot to the to the organizers uh, for uh, for having me. Um, uh, uh, thanks also uh, to Jana already like um, a point you know um, a pointing out kind of a number of things that I think I'm also going to touch upon. I also thought that some of the questions really resonated uh, with my own like confusion. You know, what am I? Um, uh, maybe just to situate uh, this talk a little bit. Um, I want to first apologize because I initially um, gave a, 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 a title that, uh, that was mapping values in AI. This is currently uh, my main research project. Um, but then I thought, uh, um, yeah, I, it may be more interesting to you uh, um, if I talk about something that's a bit more digital methods related. Um, and that is a, a project that I've uh, started uh, working on with uh, two colleagues um, a couple of months ago. But um, actually, I was able to, uh, to gather uh, the main, uh, to finish the main data collection just, uh, just last week. So I thought, like, I push that in. So you're, you're going to have a, the pleasure of uh, uh, the, well, we'll see if it's pleasure. But uh, <laughs> you'll have the opportunity to, uh, to witness like a, like a bit of a hybrid talk. Um, uh, that uh, tries to combine both of those uh, things. Then the first one, you know, is going to be a bit less uh, digital methods related. But, but, but I hope to use that to also like situate some of the work that we are doing at the Digital Methods Initiative in, Amst in Amsterdam. Um, I mean, uh, Jana, of course, had, uh, uh, talked about digital methods as a, as, as a, in a, within a social science context, but we are not social scientists, right? We're not at the social science department. We're the humanities department. Most of us have a humanities background. Um, and within the digital methods uh, initiative, of course, a lot of the uh, research that is done is um, uh, you know, social science focused. So there's a, clearly an aspect there, you know, particular issue, issues and, and so forth. But, but a lot of us do um, what, what you could call medium research, right? So uh, uh, if, uh, you know, if you have read uh, uh, you know, the work of Marshall McLuhan, um, we, we try to do things like this. Um, and, and of course, uh, this becomes more and more um, not indistinguishable, but the necessity to combine with social research. So it's really hard to say something about a platform like YouTube without looking at the communities, without looking at the issues that emerge, right? But it's also becoming increasingly problematic to say something about, you know, what's happening socially or culturally on YouTube without taking into account things like recommender systems, affordances, search algorithms, and so forth. So I'm not uh, um, uh, uh, pointing this kind of like humanities uh, context out to, to make a demarcation but rather to, to uh, uh, argue for uh, an, an alliance um, that uh, hopefully uh, um, you know, each side can, uh, can help the other um, move forward. Move forward with what? Um, in, in the context of, uh, of this talk, but in general, in the context of my work, I'm, I'm really kind of interested in, in understanding technologies of me as, as media, right? I think, about, I think of myself as, as a technologist or a technology researcher, right? But not technology in the sense of some mechanism, you know, perform some task and then retune it, but uh, in the context of thinking, ah, you know, these, these technologies, and when I think, when I say technologies, I mean, you know, whatever has a processor in it, right? So I'm interested in computers. Um, they, they really have uh, taken up uh, so many uh, cultural functions, communicative functions. Uh, uh, they uh, play role, they, they play, um, an important role, increasingly important role in, in not just interaction, but almost in, in mediating the access to the world that surrounds us, right? And, and, and I really like to use uh, this slide uh, because that was really like a, like, a, like a moment of vindication, right? So I, I wrote my PhD uh, many years ago on the, on, the, on the politics of search engines, right? So that was really kind of my main, my main research interest. And I think search engines remain, you know, like a really important part of this online e e e e ecology. And, and when Angela Merkel pointed out, ah, you know, search engines are uh, distorting our perception. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the term distorting perception because perception, of course, is always mediation. It's always uh, selective. It always has a, you know, a substance to it. But, but it really kind of put the subject on, uh, on, um, on the table, right? And, uh, well, the last uh, two or three years have really, of course, you know, within the context of American politics, radicalization and so forth, but also within, within Europe, have really put this issue of um, algorithmic mediation on the, on the forefront, right? 
So, so, for, so for me, the, the, the challenge here is to say, okay, so how can we think about technologies as media and, and vice versa, right? Media as technologies to get to the, like the, the core of, um, of, of, you know, kind of the, the, the substance of that mediation that algorithms are increasingly um, performing. So, so I, I, will, I will, you know, kind of come from this side and, and, um, and, and eventually arrive at, uh, at digital methods. Um, the, the thing that is really important for me when I talk about uh, technologies um, is on the one side their epistemological character, right? So, so what kind of knowledge machines uh, um, uh, are, you know, algorithms, but also, you know, all kinds of computational mechanisms and also their normative thrust. What do I mean by that? No, normative thrust uh, is not necessarily uh, something that, uh, uh, you know, has to do with a, like a particular like ethical value or a, a particular kind of political conviction. But the idea that, uh, um, you know, something like a, like a chair, like a door, uh, like architecture influences the way, uh, the way we live. So that is kind of like my main, uh, my main um, um, uh, research, uh, research interest and increasingly uh, focused on large-scale online platforms, right? One could argue that these are, in many ways, the most developed um, and most emblematic uh, manifestations of um, what, uh, what, what Coldry and Hepp have called deep mediatization, right? This is kind of a way to describe the current situation we're living in, um, where we, we witness a deepening of technology-based interdependence, right? And, and, you know, that has all kinds of, uh, all kinds of uh, consequences. So the, the first part of this talk um, um, is, is um, dedicated to a project uh, that uh, um, two colleagues uh, and I, Geoff Gordon and uh, Giovanni Sileno, have, uh, have started uh, uh, last year, um, and it combines... Um, uh, well, m media studies in, in, in my case uh, with a, a legal scholarship and, um, and computer science. Um, and, and this, if you will, is one of the many approaches to getting a grip on what I just said, right? The role of technology within contemporary um, society. Um, and, and what we're interested in is to develop a conceptual framework on the one side, but then also a methodology that has a digital methods component um, for, for thinking about and for investigating how values, and I'm going to talk about what I mean by values in a second, between computational mechanisms and, you know, think technology, uh, maybe more broadly, interfaces, uh, database structures, uh, and the human world, right? Um, and, and we particularly focus on, on how do platforms, how do those technological objects come to be? Right? How is something like, like, like YouTube's remender, recommender system, um, you know, built, designed, uh, uh, optimized, uh, and so forth? So research, design, and, and deployment. Um, we're looking, we're particularly interested in what we call assemblages of values. Right? So uh, if you think about a value, of course, uh, um, very often that, that sounds like very big, you know, like which kind of values do, uh, do uh, uh, search engines foster or, you know, which kind of, um, which kind of um, uh, principles our are, um, are recommender system, uh, systems built on. But, but we mean values in a, much, in a much broader context, right, as kind of sources, sources for decision making, if you will. So, so what goes into decision making when a platform is being built? You know, when, when the platform, when design choices are being made? Um, what goes in there? And there's, of course, a lot of stuff, right? There are economic models, social theories. There are, of course, ethical principles. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the large platform owners very often uh, push that to the foreground, right? Saying, ah, you know, uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is a, like a master of that, you know, bringing the world together, right? And we can, of course, laugh about that, um, but it also makes sense to, uh, to uh, think about that more, ser uh, more seriously. Experimental evaluations are, are, uh, are a part of that. So, so by values, we understand the, con the constructs used to define and justify design goals and, and decisions. And, and then, if you will, now sounds maybe a little bit far away from kind of the topic of this data sprint, digital methods, but it goes precisely to what Jana has said before, right? Understanding the platform that, that you know, is, is, is so central to, um, to our research uh, uh, practices. Um, so besides these kind of like 
e explicit elements for decision making. We're interested in kind of the, a wider network of what you could call, you know, technicities, but also practices, ideas, well, again, values, but also knowledges, right? What informs machine behavior and what informs the arrangement of, um, of, interface, of interfaces. Um, Ian Bogost has, uh, in an article in 2015, uh, uh, argued that concepts like algorithm, which are really heavily discussed uh, at, the, at the moment, have become sloppy shorthands, slang terms for the act of mistaking multi-part complex systems for simple singular ones. Um, I, think, I think that's really kind of like a, an important uh, framing here also, the, the way that um, this whole kind of debate, um, uh, uh, you know, about the power of algorithms, um, or the power of artificial intelligence, of course, those, those terms are increasingly used interchangeably, um, uh, is very often kind of problematically focusing on like an imaginary core where everything sits, right? Um, uh, in, in, when in fact, uh, all of this is, is much, uh, much uh, um, more spread out, right? I mean, the context uh, of, of kind of my thinking about this is a bit the, the, the thought of, uh, of, uh, of Gilbert Simondon indeed, um, who, who thinks about functional meaning, right? That's really kind of the core of his philosophy of technology. He says machines or technology signify by what they do, right? They don't just, uh, they're not just, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, interpreted, they're not just embedded in sociality, but they have their own meaning and their meaning is their function. Um, our research project in this case treats, um, or we have a case, right? We don't want to necessarily be limited to that, but we are particularly interested in recommender systems as something that you know, allows us to, to bind our discussion a little bit. And, and, and for me, um, I've uh, over the last uh, two years um, uh, um, really focused also my empirical work on, on YouTube. Uh, recommender system in this case means YouTube's recommender system uh, uh, most of all, right? Um, so if we think about these, these recommender systems as, a, as, as knowledge systems, how can we capture their epistemological character, right, and understand how they, how they, how they came to be, right? Um, uh, and, and, and of course, right, these, um, these uh, uh, recommender systems are, and there's a number of studies of, uh, 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 on that, right, are, are, are really quite influential in kind of influencing what people consume, right? So there is really kind of this overlap with, uh, with social research and in part maybe we can indeed also repurpose them to better understand the communities uh, and the cultural phenomena out there. So again, this kind of like dual, dual um, uh, direction. Just methodologically, I don't wanna go into that uh, uh, too deeply, but when you deal with an object like, like YouTube, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's very hard to get like a serious interview with somebody working at that company, right? So this is not a, a place where you can easily do an ethnographic workplace study and, and you know, kind of like interview the algorithm makers. Uh, so we're a little bit inspired by, um, by um, a methodology that uh, uh, Marike de Goede and, and others and colleagues have called encircling, right? So they are security researchers um, and they, uh, they say that encircling entails a lateral multi-pronged creative iterative approach of secret sites, confidential materials, and classified practices. It is less focused on uncovering the kernel of the secret that is on, uh, than, than it is on analyzing the mundane life worlds of security practices and practitioners that are powerfully structured through codes and rights of uh, secrecy. I mean, this doesn't like one-to-one -one transfer on this platform situation, but, but it, 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 I think it just evokes this idea that um, uh, uh, for example, doing an algorithmic audit, right, is, is something that is currently being proposed quite a bit by regulators, is on the one side uh, probably, probably a really mistaken imaginary, um, but, but also uh, practically uh, very, very um, uh, difficult. So our goal isn't like to nail down these systems, right, to reverse engineer the algorithms, um, but rather uh, to deepen our standing uh, of technical creation and its uh, various entanglements. I just want to just quickly give you a little bit uh, an idea how, how that, met, met that methodology is structured um, and kind of like uh, working progressively towards its, uh, its digital methods uh, component. So I'm maybe going to accelerate a little bit that first, uh, uh, that first aspect and then spend a bit more time on the second one. Um, but in general, we distinguish what you could call ambient knowledge, um, which concerns, you know, kind of recommender systems in general 
like what is known about recommender systems, right? It's not like a, like a confidential technology, right? If you want to build a, a recommender system, there is a lot of uh, stuff out there, and the people who build actual systems, of course, draw on that. But then we have what you could call local practices. Another way of maybe separating the two would be exogenous and, and uh, um, uh, um, endogamous, but I think it's maybe easier to uh, talk about like ambient knowledge and local practices. So local practices is what happens you know, in a particular site, at a particular company, um, when something is, is you know, implemented, maintained, and adapted. Uh, just real quick, I mean, ambient knowledge, I think this is so, so this is really what, what you know, I've, been, I've been working on over the last years quite intensive, intensively. Um, um, uh, and um, uh, Jeanne already mentioned I have a, a book forthcoming called The Engines of Order that, that looks quite a bit into things like this. What do engineers know and how, they, how do they know it, right? What are, what are engineers, you know, kind of what, what goes into the making of a technical object? Um, and I have to admit that part of my tool building effort in digital methods is an excuse to, to program, right? Um, uh, uh, I want to know. I want to know how to build technical objects. I want to work with the code. I want to use the libraries, right? And maybe in a way that's a bit more meaningful than just uh, just uh, playing around with them. Um, so, so all of that technical stuff, those are established fields of knowledge, right? So, a computer scientist here, right? There's a there's there there are classes you can take, right? There are books you can read, um, uh, and and uh, kind of this first part, the ambient knowledge. Uh, we've um, we've uh, uh, um, distinguished uh, three uh, uh, directions uh, that one can look at, but but of course it's not just it's not just purely descriptive knowledge, right? I, I like to use these terms here. Uh, Pureland he uses uh, the term epistemological assumptions, right? So engineers have assumptions about what knowledge is and how it works, right? Um, and hacking a philosopher of science uses the term style of reasoning when he talks about different. Um, different uh, uh, um, uh, disciplines, and one could, for example, even ask, what is the style of reasoning of digital methods? Right? How are arguments constructed? What is admitted within the space of legitimate knowledge? Um, Alain de Rosier uses the term um, uh, 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 um, epistemological, ontological attitude when he talks about four ways of thinking about statistics. Right? So, so it's not just kind of um, you know purely uh, descriptive knowledge, but um, but indeed, um, uh, uh, something that you know is entangled with um, maybe more profound and, and not always a clearly clearly uh, 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 visual uh, elements. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to go into these uh, three elements in, in, in great detail, but real quickly, right? So when we want to learn about um, a lot about recommender systems, uh, uh, we can you know we can read the literature, right? Um, I do this in general historically. Uh, uh, I think that really. Uh, uh, really uh, helps uh, uh, find a way into fields that have you know thousands of publications coming out um, uh, uh, you know re over over the the last uh, uh, decade and um, uh, uh, working historically uh, can really really help right so this is one of the first uh, papers here by uh, Rasnik and Varian where they really kind of set up the field of recommender systems one can read that one can one can look at their the, 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 the reasons and the, and the rationales that they put forward, right? One can read like what is being problematized to what kind of problem is a recommender system a solution, you know, according to them. Um, this is all like very, very ac uh, accessible. Um, in this case, you know, very often it's that term information overload. Uh, that is, I think, within information retrieval, which is maybe this larger field, is really the defining rationale uh, um, uh, that sits you know, behind a lot of the motivations that are there. We can look at the, the formal constructs being used, right? So um, um, uh, uh, the, the, the notion of a feature vector, right? That's, for example, something that is, is really kind of connecting the field in many, many ways, right? So I don't have to explain what a feature vector is to a, to a, a computer scientist, but it's a, it's a very simple construct that basically is basically a valued list Right? You can say, you know, a list, a user is, is a list, is the list of songs they listen to. A song is the list of users that have listened to it. A text is the words that are in there and how often they appear, right? And the feature vector is a construct 
uh, that then allows for the application of all kinds of algorithmic techniques very, very quickly and very, very easily. And this is also something that, for example, we do when we use uh, machine learning in uh, social research, right? We, we design feature vectors and then we, um, we, uh, we play with them. So there's much more historical stuff to say. Um, I, 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 really, um, I really enjoy, have to, I have to admit, uh, reading these uh, older, uh, older papers that are very often, they're a little bit naive, but they're also very open. They're very speculative. They're very, they're very beautiful, actually. Um, not like the, the much more black boxed texts that are, are more, more contemporary. Um, the second element that one can look at, for example, uh, uh, in these engineering practices are metrics and uh, evaluative practices. So how are technologies being evaluated? How, you know, how, how do engineers, when they build a particular system, define what is successful and what is not successful? Um, uh, uh, for example, within the, within the field of information retrieval, there has been a real tradition of, um, of experimental evaluations. You could almost call them rituals of, of evaluation. Very often pitting a computer system against some like predefined group of experts. So, uh, um, uh, you know, let's say you have a, you have a, a classification task, right? Uh, let's say an image, image classification task. How do, you, how do you say that a, an algorithm is good at it? And, and you read that all the time, right? You, you read that all the time in the newspapers that, oh, this uh, a new something something system uh, is 98% is correct, right? Um, well, compared to what? That's mostly human classification, right? So, uh, so a lot of the evaluation within these fields relies on the one side on metrics. The most famous ones are being recall and precision within that context but also comparisons with you know, uh, uh, different, uh, different uh, human classifications. And it's quite spicy that actually in the, in the, the first of these uh, big evaluations in the 1960s uh, um, uh, that pitted two groups against each other, the human groups couldn't agree uh, uh, on, on, the on the correct, you know, kind of the thing to test against, right? Which kind of shows us uh, that all of this is kind of entangled in much more complex um, um, you know, kind of situations. Um, yeah, I mean, very, very interesting. Uh, Peter Norvik recently uh, uh, said, you know, engineering success shows that something is working right, working right. And so it is evidence, but not proof of a scientifically successful model. I really love that term engineering success, right? We always, or very often, uh, um, these kind of systems are presented as, um, you know, the, the panacea of, 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 you know, kind of like scientific purity. Well, in fact, they're really not, right? Engineer engineering uh, success is very often, you know, the result of, uh, of patchworking s stuff together, but we, which you only half understand, but somehow it works so awesome, right? Um, and then, of course, there are notions like information need and revealed preference that sit behind all of that. Um, we can look into, you know, handbooks. This is the most referenced handbook within the field of recommender systems. And they propose 14 categories for how to evaluate recommender systems. So this is like extremely explicit. And this is in part what we mean by values. You know, what's being put forward? Well, those are 14 things that are being put forward, you know? Uh, and some of that is very interesting. Some of it is privacy. Some of it within the context of, um, of recommender systems is diversity, novelty, right? But then also something like, like scalability. Does, it, does, does your system work with 10, 100, 1,000, a billion users? You know, as things, like, things like this. Um, so, so these are really kind of explicit, explicit uh, value formations, but uh, formulations, they are of course, uh, they're of course then kind of like embedded within uh, particular, particular sites. Um, I mean, uh, very importantly, uh, um, uh, some of you may know this, uh, this website, it's, it's called Kaggle, um, and it's really kind of the equivalent of these earlier information retrieval kind of rituals, right? Kaggle is a site that was bought by Google, obviously, in 2017, where you can host data science machine learning challenges, right? So you basically, you provide a data set, right? Maybe just 80% of the data set, right? And then you test it against 20, and then groups of researchers or you know, hobbyists will, will compete. Uh, uh, and this is a, a, yeah, a kind of, again, a very important site for these kind of rituals of, uh, of uh, evaluation. Um, 
Well, that term ecology, uh, it, I'm kind of maybe using that uh, in, in here a little bit uh, in, a, in a kind of like wide understanding. But yeah, again, I'm going to make some uh, advertisement for uh, my, my first coming book, which is called A Mechanology of Algorithmic Techniques. Uh, Gilbert Simondon, he, he talked about a sociology or a psychology of machines, right? So how would you shrink a machine? And we can, of course, think that in this kind of like, like a science fiction idea, you know? Or we can really think like, what kind of ways do we have to look at, at that kind of technically, um, you know, kind of playing around or screwing around with technology. This is a way to kind of approach these systems, get a, get a hang of it, right? Um, so for example, there's a, a paper by uh, a Möller and, and, and context uh, and, and colleagues, sorry, that, uh, that indeed they just tried out different recommender systems and how they, you know, that are available out there and how they, how they react. So this is another way of approaching this. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of like open source libraries that one can download and one can play with together, you know, just a, a, an intuition for how those systems, uh, those systems perform. So just the, the, the second part of the first part, so those were a little bit kind of these, these ambient knowledge elements. This is all stuff that you know, exists and you don't have to go anywhere uh, and interview anybody, right? This is just stuff that is being known uh, um, uh, to, to, uh, to everyone in that field, at least in theory. Um, whereas local practices really you know, refer to what's happening at a concrete site. So what's happening in Mountain View in YouTube's headquarters uh, when they when they think about um, uh, uh, you know let's uh, let's build a recommender system, um, and and that is of course much harder to know right. The, the the first stuff is actually really yeah of course you need some technical knowledge but um, uh, uh, there is really no uh, issue with uh, with access it stands uh, wide open, whereas the way concrete systems are are designed is is much more uh, more complicated right. Um, um, well, in, in our case, um, we would like to, uh, uh, and this kind of like depends on, on, on whether we're able to receive follow-up funding, but we would like to look at a, an academic laboratory that builds recommender systems and quite possibly a, 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 a YouTube, right? Um, and here again, there are kind of three directions that one can go into. Um, the first one being an analysis of incentive structures, um, ethnographic investigation, and technical observation. So analysis of incentives, very quickly, this is just something that I'm constantly a lot confronted with. I, I, I started uh, uh, to work uh, last year as an expert member in the European Commission's observatory on the online platform economy. Uh, so I'm a bit like the geek in there, right? Um, uh, but I'm confronted constantly with people who, um, who, 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 uh, who reason in economic terms. So, so normally these kind of, um, these kind of you know, uh, um, expert uh, uh, committees that that you know uh, um, give input into into regulation. There's only lawyers and economists, right? Maybe from time to time a political scientist may you know ha have a little bit of uh, of time there, and of course sometimes the technical disciplines. Um, but but kind of looking at incentive structures is a way of thinking. You now, so how how to understand the platform, right? How to understand maybe why a, a recommender system is designed uh, um, like it like it is, right? In the case of uh, in the case of YouTube, uh, one could uh, one could look at this, right? And one could look at the at the market uh, the market relationships, and this is a bit the like the, the main theoretical model of a two-sided market, which is you know the main economic model that um, that uh, kind of describes these particular platform settings. Uh, uh, Jean Tirol uh, um, uh, received the uh, Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on this. So platform economics starts in the beginning of 2000s. And one can do something like this, you know, for YouTube. One can think about, ah, you know, it's maybe not just two sides, but maybe there are three sides. There are end users on YouTube, right? There are content creators, there are advertisers. And then, you know, things become more complicated. There's Patreon, there are those multi-channel networks. So the whole thing is a bit complicated. But of course, the recommender system, like, is supposed to generate value within that, right? And, and uh, some of you may know that one of the leading microeconomists, microeconomists, in the world, Hal Varian is uh, is Google's uh, uh, is Google's chief e economist. So um, uh, uh, th those are this is the kind of reasoning that goes into that. Second element, um, ethnographic investigation. Yeah. So as I said before, we're not going to go into YouTube. I mean, as, at least I don't think so. 
uh, and, uh, and really be able to you know, uh, participate in meetings or something. But there's of, of course, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of stuff out there um, that one can use. There's uh, first party published material like research papers, patents, interviews, uh, gray literature, regulatory fi filings. I mean, I don't know if this qualifies as ethnography, but, but there is a, a way to kind of like access the speech, if you will, of, uh, of, these, uh, of these actors, um, including publications. So for example, this is a 2016 publication uh, uh, by the makers of YouTube's recommender system on YouTube's recommender system, right? So this is something that, that we can read. And this, in this case, it's not kind of like this ambient publication, but they talk about how they built their system. Um, yeah, but, but of course, there are, there are, uh, 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 this is limited. I mean, there are a lot of third parties out there, you know, like industry experts, um, uh, uh, the users themselves, that also develop like some understanding of how the platform works. So we found that a lot in our research on, uh, on YouTube, uh, YouTube ranking, that the, the video makers themselves, they have some like imaginary on how the platform works, right? And they try to, uh, they try to tweak uh, and try to act in accordance. Uh, and, and, and at least part of that is, uh, can be quite useful. Um, I mean, some of that, you know, uh, um, as it used to exist more explicitly, this is uh, from the Wayback Machine. So, so YouTube talked about how they how they con not necessarily construct, but what, go what went into their recommender system at that point in time. So that, that page disappeared in 2015, and there is now no more uh, official uh, kind of explanation. But this kind of explained that they had this like three parts of the recommender system. They had what they call the related videos, and this is stuff that is still accessible via the API. So this is something we can actually study empirically. Then there's the personalized recommendation, right? And this is something that we can maybe scrape from the interface. Um, and then there is uh, uh, videos from the same channel, right? So this is how they talked about it. Well, it's now three years, four, almost four years ago. So it takes a while, right? And, and, and this is kind of really um, where this kind of third element, this is now kind of my, 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 my not jump, but drift over to digital methods, um, what we call technical observation, right? So, so um, and, and there the, are the, currently a lot of people trying to do this stuff. It's just not so easy. Um, but this is, uh, this is somebody who is uh, doing this kind of work, uh, Guillaume Chasselot. Uh, he, um, he used to work for, uh, for YouTube, uh, uh, and now he, uh, he has a, 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 a website um, where, um, where he scrapes uh, um, you know, a number of channels, number of videos every day. Uh, and, and then, you know, kind of uh, uh, you know, grabs the recommendations and not just the related videos, but also the, the personalized recommendation and, and thereby tries to understand what's happening, what's happening on, the, on the platform. So, so technical observation, that's, I have to say, is really my main focus now in, the, in digital methods work, right? This is really what I'm interested in. I want to understand the platform. Um, is, is, is one way of trying to capture the epistemological character of the system through you know, empirical, uh, empirical research. Um, and, and there's been a bunch of that, right? Uh, this is a study by, um, by uh, uh, Pew, the Pew Internet Project that, that you know, thought they were making a study on YouTube's uh, recommender system. Unfortunately, they were not, um, because the only thing they actually had access to were the related videos, which are not the most important component of the recommender system, so that a, a big research institution like Pew makes a mistake like this um, shows us uh, that um, how hard uh, how hard uh, this this is. Um, just as a footnote, um, kind of this question like what kind of data do we have access to? Uh, th that's really kind of the hill I'm trying to die on within that European Commission work, right? So we're really trying to push for more access to data from platforms in order to be able to do this kind of work better, right? So uh, this is not just something where you can say, you know, we have to just stand there and accept the data that is given to us, but this is something where we can say, well, we can ask for the data. Nicely, maybe not so nicely, right? So uh, having, a, having, for example, a, you know, what's it called, like a bigger stick uh, may be uh, necessary in that, uh, in that context. And um, the institution, I think, that has the biggest stick close to us is, is the European Commission. Um, so, so, so yeah, there's also definitely lobbying, uh, lobbying in, uh, involved. I mean, 
there's still a lot of stuff that one can do through API data, particularly when it comes to YouTube, right? Um, distributed scraping is a very, very interesting technique. Maybe the most successful project was in Germany, um, the Datenspende project. Um, they uh, asked, uh, it was in um, collabor collaboration between uh, University, Algorithm Watch, uh, an NGO, and, um, and Der Spiegel. Um, and uh, they asked 4,500, well, but they asked more, but 4,500 4, users installed a plugin within their, uh, within their browser. Um, and then uh, the researchers were able to launch Google queries and YouTube queries through that plugin, right? Um, and then, of course, has the, the real advantage that whereas the API gives us access to this, like, you know, kind of like baseline data, if you have a plugin within user browsers, you get access to stuff like localization and personalization, right? But this is, of course, very, very heavy to do. Um, um, myself and, and colleagues, uh, we try to do... Um, we try to look in particularly into, um, into ranking on, uh, on YouTube. Um, uh, and here you can see um, a visualization. It's a type of visualization we call uh, a rank flow. And this is basically, uh, it's, a very, it's actually kind of very simple what's, what's happening here. Um, these are basically seven weeks of three uh, queries submitted to YouTube's search API, right? So it's not directly the recommendation system, but the, the, the search ranking, but that is important in its own right, right? Uh, YouTube is the second largest search engine in the, in the world. Um, and every week is a, is a column here. Um, and every block is a video, right? Um, the size of the, of the block is the number of views. So you can, for example, see that this thing here, you know, has a lot of views. Um, and I just want to kind of draw your attention. I'm not supposed to go that far, but I can go here. Um, uh, I want to draw your attention to this moment here, you know? There is some regularity here. This video is present. Suddenly it's gone for, what, six days, seven days, and then goes back again, right? Um, and this is a little bit what we found, right? So we weren't able to, re to reverse engineer the algorithm, right? This is, this is I think, uh, really uh, completely impossible. Um, but we were able to distinguish between what we called ranking morphologies, right? So this is, uh, this is basically kind of, a, an, you know, kind of the, the standard authority type uh, uh, ranking. Uh, 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 this is, is, um, is what we called a new C morphology, right? This were seven weeks in summer 2016 with the query Trump. Um, and there was no video in there for more than four days, right? So we have a constant churn of new stuff coming in. And this here is basically almost like Google search ranking flipping a switch, flipping a switch between kind of like a more standard, uh, standard mode and then kind of this, this newsy incursion here, um, which in this case for the Syria query were really like really strange videos. We call them war porn. Um, uh, this is just videos of war machinery operating. So it's just like rockets launching and, and stuff firing, right? It's just machinery. Um, so, so this is a way of, uh, of you know, kind of um, um, on the one side, of course, uh, uh, getting closer to, you know, understanding how the platform works, if you will. But, but it's also kind of interesting for, from a digital methods perspective. Because, of course, if you use search as research, and, you know, as Jana said, you use queries in order to go into, uh, into YouTube's uh, like mass of video, well, you're confronted with this, right? You're confronted with the fact that this changes quite a bit, and that should, of course, give us pause. I mean, there's much more stuff that one can do. Um, uh, um, a student of mine um, worked a little bit on, um, on um, uh, uh, Spotify, right? Uh, so there's some, some excess, uh, excess there. I thought that was a really interesting, uh, interesting uh, uh, research into their recommender system which basically allowed him to show that, um, that uh, Jukub's, uh, uh, sorry, Spotify's recommender system pushes into the, into the details, right? Pushes, pushes deeper into the catalog rather than, you know, towards the most popular uh, uh, stuff. So I think that's an interesting, um, uh, it's interesting research. But um, I want to maybe uh, um, kind of now use this, uh, this, this beginning of, you know, kind of something more empirical to engage uh, uh, that empirical side more, uh, more properly. Um, but just some, uh, some intermediary conclusions, right? Um, so 
in, in, in this kind of mapping, mapping values project, um, we, we're on the one side, of course, interested in the, social, in the you know, social embedding of the construction of these recommender systems, um, but we're also really interested in the technicity itself, right? So for us, it's not, again, kind of values doesn't mean that some human thing goes into technology, right? Technology itself is, 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 is you know, kind of uh, drives uh, and produces like normativity and, and value statements. Um, so, so indeed, normativity is not exclusive to moral reasoning, right? I think, think that is very important. Um, um, and, and I think what a lot of this like practical work and particularly our project on ranking uh, has really shown um, is, is um, mm, that, uh, you know, in all of this, we can also not kind of ignore that like what's being ranked, right? So I think that is also very important. Of course, the clear outcome in a concrete system are kind of like negotiations between that ambient part and that, that local part. And, and to understand what constitutes like a good recommendation for YouTube, one has to look into all of that. Um, but to, to follow this now a little bit, a little bit deeper into the, into the rabbit hole, I want to talk to you about a, a, a project that uh, has been, you know, has been, in, has been simmering Quite a quite a bit, uh, quite a, quite some time, and it's a bit uh, it's a bit of follow up to to this project. Um, so this project I did with um, uh, two researchers, uh, uh, Ariana Matamoros uh, and uh, Oscar Oscar Colomina, um, and um, mm, this mapping uh, mapping YouTube project is also a collaboration with these uh, uh, these two uh, uh, researchers. Um, and and again, we started a little bit from this bogus thing, like you know, algorithms. No, it's it's systems, right? Um, um, and, 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 and YouTube obviously isn't just its recommender system, right? There's much more happening on there, right? One could do many different things. One could do an interface analysis. One could do, you know, kind of all kinds of things. But one may also be interested in, in, in the actual outcomes of these social technical processes. And by outcomes, I don't mean like social effects, but rather what is it's a very naive question. What is on YouTube, right? What what what's there? What is finding an audience? Um, and, and and basically, what we're trying to do is, if you will, uh, is, is 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 document the state of the full system. Of, of course, it's a it's a partial you know view and uh, and you know uh, it has its its own limitations. But it, it includes, if you will, not just the technical part. Or quite on the contrary much less the technical part, but basically the outcome of this distributed um, uh, system, which includes you know, the technical and also public cultures, vernaculars, issues, dyna issue dynamics, national dynamics, uh, um, and so forth. So, so, so this is kind of another attempt to say, what can we say about YouTube empirically you know, through data collection? Um, we cannot easily look inside of the machine, but what kind of knowledge can we, uh, can we generate? Um, so, so what is on YouTube? That's our basic, uh, basic question. Um, uh, um, well, and there are all kinds of like sub-elements, right? What, what are the themes? What are the contents? What is the structure of all of that? We have some elements of reception maybe in, in the sense of, you know, audiences, uh, uh, you know, watching certain things, others not. Monetization, really, really important. Um, so so, so this, this project, um, it, it takes a bit, uh, um, a different perspective in the sense that it draws quite quite a bit on this like critical uh, media uh, media industries research. There's also stuff like production studies, right? So so our focus are YouTube channels. So uh, these are not the only way that that you know videos find an audience. Of course, every video has to be attached to a channel, but it doesn't necessarily mean that um, that you know every video is then. Uh, uh, you know, kind of, kind of uh, connected to the destiny of that channel. People make ad hoc channels just to push, to push a single video. But, but you know, kind of this connects a bit to this critical media industries uh, production studies perspective, and also I think to um, to Chetwick's notion of um, of a hybrid media system. And to Chetwick, I think he gives a, a talk on the 10th of February uh, uh, here in Lisbon. Uh, I highly recommend uh, going going to see that. Um, um, a hybrid media system where you know it's not just not just like one actor but a lot of different actors um, and I think with YouTube one can really see for example institutional like established actors versus native actors and so forth 
and the wider notion of culture of connectivity is, of course, very important. So this is an explanatory data analysis project. So we don't start with research questions, right? Um, this may be shocking to the social scientists, uh, but we have our patron saint here, right? Uh, John Tukey, who, by the way, invented the term software. Um, uh, and he wrote a big book called the Explanatory Data, Exploratory Data Analysis, um, where, where, of course, we have intuitions, we have interests, but our questions, they develop from the interaction with the data. Um, so, so, like knowledge on YouTube, right? What, what can we do? And this is a little bit also an introduction to the, the uh, practical app that I'll be doing uh, 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 later on, right? Um, uh, we, we can do a bunch of stuff, right? We can, uh, we can of course, uh, uh, you know, formulate uh, uh, research queries uh, uh, and then, you know, submit that to, um, to um, the, um, to, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, well, the interface directly or via, via uh, you know, kind of available tools to the, to the API. And this is, of course, a way that we can get out uh, data, right? And we, maybe we have to think about, okay, what to do with the ranking, right? But if we want to uh, know something about uh, how a particular issue is dealt with on, on YouTube, we, you know, the querying is, is, is definitely a, a, um, a good way. Um, in the case of something like Twitter, we have this highly interesting thing, which used to be called uh, the 1% uh, uh, sample. It's now called uh, um, the, 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 the uh, sample tweets API, right? It's still... It still, um, uh, it still calls itself a small random sample, right? And if it's truly random, it means it's representative. Uh, uh, and this is, of course, a really awesome thing. But of course, we don't have that for, uh, for YouTube. I mean, I would love to have that. I think, I think that should exist for every platform um, because this would give us you know, a, a way of, of making like overall, uh, overall assessments. Um, but a very common strategy when it comes to you know, data collection from online, platform, uh, from online platforms ha ha has been crawling. Um, crawling is uh, something that um, you know, has been particularly big in the, like the early days of the web. It's a little bit, uh, a little bit of hi history here. I, I don't know if it's anybody ever used a Navi crawler? No, but this was really kind of the start of, um, uh, so, so this was a, a tool uh, uh, developed in the Web Atlas Research Group that also built, uh, built Gephi. Um, uh, uh, that was um, headed by, uh, by the late uh, uh, Franck Itala, who really started uh, uh, all of this. Um, and Navi crawler was, a, was a, a crawler that, an interactive crawler, right? That where you could um, start crawling, then pause, then put, you know, throw some stuff away, uh, put some new seeds in, crawl again, right? So it was really like a, a qualitative crawler and uh, the Media Labs uh, Hive, Hive uh, crawler, which is now their state of the art thing, is very much built on the legacy of, of that. And, and you know, crawling is something that we can use for, for YouTube as well, right? So we could say, hey, channels, they are connected to other channels. For example, they feature them or they are subscribed to them. And there are a bunch of tools out there that allow you to do that. So there's, for example, a tool called the YouTube channel crawler, right? And you, you start with one channel or five channels, and from there you can uh, you can uh, uh, you know then you know establish a network of um, of uh, uh, channels. But 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 again, you know you, you cannot. Uh, these tools have uh, real limitations. The, the YouTube uh, data tools that that uh, that I built, um, they also have their you know there's like memory limitations, also like pretty sh shorty software. Just saying, um, uh, uh, I should know. <laughs> Um, so, so, so you can't like crawl the whole platform, right? Um, so kind of another inspiration for that project um, what, were those attempts in the, in the late 90s to crawl the whole web, right? So, so, so these systems, right, they're always very issue dri driven, right? You, you start with a particular case and from there, you know, you, you, you but, but these people here, they try to, to crawl all of the web, right? And, and does anybody remember this? Yeah? The bow tie structure of the web. It was actually a big, it's from this paper by Broder et al. that came out, well, 20 years ago. And I remember the Wired article. It basically said, oh, the web revealed to have a bow tie structure. Right? In this case, bow tie just means that there's like a heavily connected core of web pages in the middle, right? Then a lot of, of web pages just point into that core. Uh, um, but, 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 you know, the core doesn't point back. 
um, then the core points to other web pages, but they don't point back. And then you have those tendrils, right? So it was a very evocative uh, way of, uh, so we're not really interested in doing anything like this, but, but there was like a real, I wouldn't call it a fad, uh, but a real um, moment where people thought it would be possible to crawl the whole web if you're not Google, right? Um, so our approach to, 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 to mapping YouTube um, tries to map all of YouTube. Right? So this is not a, like an issue-driven thing, right? It's not like uh, I want to know about this or that. No, I want all of YouTube. Um, I'm not so sure that I'm getting all of YouTube. I'm getting quite a bit. So, so what are we doing? Um, well, first of all, there are existing approaches to mapping, to making basically a rep representative assessment of YouTube. Um, but, but their methodologies are really, I have to say, not good, right? Uh, so there's a real problem here. Um, and our approach, goes through crawling, right? We used a, a breadth first crawl, um, which means that if you, if you think, you know, you could crawl like this. There would be depth first, or you could crawl like this. Right, that's breadth first. And well, it, it, the difference has some importance, but it's maybe not so, so important here. We're starting from a single seed, a single channel. Uh, it's the Vsauce channel. It's completely irrelevant where we start from uh, in this case, actually, because we, we go into a giant component. Um, and we have a subscriber cutoff, and that's probably the biggest limitation. So, so what does that mean? Um, we start with this, our single channel. We get all the connected channels, right, either through um, subscription or through featuring. If, if the channel has less than, let's say, 1,000 subscribers, it becomes part of our set, but we do not crawl further, right? Um, whereas if it has uh, more than 100, uh, 1,000, sorry, then, then we crawl further, right? Um, we made three crawls that went until it stopped. So this is not like a depth-limited crawl. This is like the crawl that basically ended when no more channels were, uh, were uh, discovered. Um, so, so what are we missing? What are we missing through this method? Um, one way of thinking about this, and this is the reason why we made three crawls, was to compare what the three crawls get us, right? And I think the most important thing here is, is well, first of all, I mean, just anecdotally, of course, it's the six, six degrees of, uh, of separation, right? So the, the, highest, uh, the highest amount of, uh, found, uh, of found channels is at, at depth, uh, at depth uh, uh, six here, right? Here you can see actually the discovery numbers. Uh, but the most important thing is here. So we did three crawls with three different cutoffs. So that means that, like, you know, where to continue here, that changed. If I look at how many channels that have more than 100,000 subscribers, each one of those crawls found, we see that actually if I have 100,000 subscriber cutoff, I'm getting, I'm, I'm losing, I'm missing something, right? Because there may be uh, uh, channels out there that have 100,000 subscribers that I, that I can't reach because they're not directly connected with other channels that have 100,000 subscribers, right? But if I move the cut, uh, the, so if I move the, the cutoff lower, I'm getting more channels with 100,000 subscribers because I'm basically starting to jump some of those bridges, right? And if I move still lower, I get a little bit more, right? Just a little bit more. That means we're quite confident in that number. We're quite confident that we have almost all channels that have 100,000 100, or more subscribers. We're a bit less confident in this number even less confident in that number and the least confident in that number, right? So basically, this is a little bit how to think about this crawl. So in the end, we got 36 million channels. Uh, normal estimates for channel numbers out there say it's between 20, 22 million, 25 million, so we get many more, right? Um, and this is a little bit the, the data that, that we're capturing, right? So we have um, 153,000 channels with more than 100,000 subscribers. 923, more than 10, and 4.4 million that have 
you know, a thousand subscribers or, or more. For these channels, we have all the video metadata that they have ever posted. For these two, we have all the IDs so we know when they posted the video, and then we have a 1% metadata sample, right? Still, we're not like, since we're not super confident in, in that thing here, the 36 million, we, we have not sampled that. So we're gonna probably in the first paper talk about that a little bit, but we're gonna mainly focus on these three and particularly on the, on the elite. So I wanna show you a couple of results um, from that. Um, for those of you who think like, ah, oh, which digital methods tools should I learn? Quite honestly, um, if you have the time, just make the jump. Just, just, just do some Python. It's, I know, you know, it's not that, you know, it's a bit scary, but the combination between Python and Jupyter Notebooks, it's just so great. It's really, it's, it's, it's Lego, it's, 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 just, it's just awesome, right? It's, I'm really baffled by how easy that stuff is and how easily you can document your own research, right? So a lot of this, all the statistical stuff I use uh, Jupyter Notebooks for with a combination with, uh, with Python. Some numbers, um, maybe not gonna go into the details here. How much more time do I have? I have like one hour and 10 minutes, right? Yes, yes I have, okay, good. Um, but, but these are just some of the distributions here. Here I'm looking at the, the 4.4 million channels that have uh, more than 1,000 subscribers. So it's not the elite, it's a bit the broader, the broader thing. But what you can already see with those distributions, you know, is look at the subscriber count, you know? You really get this kind of um, like power law distribution. Uh, the, 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 if we, the, the, the cutoff between, you know, the, the top 10% and the lower 90% is 26,000 subscribers, right? That means 10% of channels have more than 26,000 and 90% have, have fewer, right? So we get this kind of classic uh, uh, distribution curve and we see that, that elsewhere uh, as, as well, you know, with the, the view counts, right? So the elite really sucks up quite a bit of, uh, of YouTube in terms of um, subscribers, but also the elite is pretty big, right? So it's, uh, we're talking about, you know, kind of uh, those 150,000 channels that have more than uh, 100,000 subscribers. For us, very important is, is how many channels are featuring other channels, how many channels are subscribing to other channels, because not every channel makes subscriptions available. Um, but actually, it's not that bad. So, so we have actually more than a quarter of the channels who subscribe to other channels, which really gives us quite some confidence in the quality of our sample. It's really a very dense network, right? Um, yeah. This is very interesting. Zero, zero, zero comment count, right? It's a field in the API, but it's not, there's no data coming out. So that's also part of digital methods work, right? No data coming out. Um, so since we have, um, you know, video, video metadata for the elite, and here I'm looking just at the elite, we're able to do stuff like this, right? So those are the 150,000 150, channels. So that's the elite. So whenever I say elite, it's the 153,000 channels that have more than 100,000 subscribers. That's the elite. And they post it in the history of their existence, 140 million videos. And here you can see the growth pattern. But time is very, is very problematic with our sample. Right? If you do a snapshot like this, there's, there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of problems. Um, there's, you know, there's lack of data, for example. So we don't know subscribers over time. Uh, platforms like um, Social Blade, they have that. We don't have it. So that's a problem. Then also we have a collection time span. So the data that you saw here was collected over a month and a half uh, uh, on a machine that actually looks exactly like this, which bombarded YouTube's API uh, with 200 threads in parallel with up to 10 million queries per day for one and a half months. Um, so that's a lot of data on the one side but it's uh, one month and a half and stuff happens within mon one month and a half, right? So that's a, that's a problem uh, that we simply cannot avoid. Then there's just deleted channels and videos, right? That YouTube is constantly, you know, kind of cracking down uh, on, uh, on channels. So, so this snapshot character makes all of these things a little bit tricky because this in, in many ways is already like, you know, that term survivorship buyers, those are the channels that basically made it, you know? 
uh, those are the channels, the elite now. That doesn't mean that they were the elite a year ago or two years ago. Um, again, the elite. Uh, this is a way to think about what's out there in terms of content, right? Um, there are many ways of doing this, and, and we're going to try a lot of different things. Um, but these are the categories that YouTube assigns to channels. So these categories are algorithmically assigned, which means that you know Google has some, uh, YouTube has some, uh, some uh, uh, machine learning system, right, where they look at the videos that uh, people post, and these are the categories that they uh, that they attribute. You you can see here that within each of them there's some stuff missing, right? It's because some channels are you know uh, uh, get the uh, category attribute music and, and, and nothing else right so they're, they're not put into pop music or something right um, I mean this is already kind of as, as such interesting because you can see a little bit like like how YouTube orders YouTube right and, and here you get a, a quantitative uh, um, a distribution um, another thing that that maybe is kind of interesting to you is um, is country channels, right? Uh, channels per country. Here on the left side, we have again the elite, and I'm just going to look at the, that. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to look at that uh, at that side here for the for the moment. Um, here you can see the, the 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 that blue here is not a number. It's not available. So for many channels, we don't have a self-selected country identifier, right? Um, and actually, when we look at the 4.4 million channels, we see that there are many more channels who are lacking that data. So already we can see that in general those elite channels, they make a, like a bigger effort, right, on all the levels, not just making more videos, making better videos, but also better metadata and so forth, right? Um, we can of course see, you know, biggest, biggest US, India, and then of course, as always, Brazil, uh, this beautiful social media dystopia. Um, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's at least halfway through, right? Um, uh, so, uh, so we got that. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, then we have like, you know, the other, so the top 10 is already more than, uh, than uh, two thirds of all the channels, right? And then we have, we have a bunch of other, uh, a bunch of, uh, uh, other uh, things. Here I basically removed the not a number, so it's the same thing, but one can see this a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, 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 easier. Um, here, uh, uh, we are kind of really interested in thinking more deeply about um, how to deal with countries and we're preparing a machine learning approach to, uh, to basically filling up that data based on language analysis and network analysis. But uh, that's a little bit uh, different. Here's a, here's a um, yeah, I hope you can see that. Here's a, a, a network of the, um, the uh, elite again, so the 153,000 uh, channels. Uh, colored by country, and and one of, but there's a number of interesting things. I mean, the, the first one is actually Brazil is the least connected to the main core, right? Whereas a lot of the other countries are quite strongly connected with what happens here in the middle, which is English language channels. Brazil is probably the one that falls out the furthest, uh, which I think is quite uh, quite interesting. Uh, India, for example, is also a little bit uh, uh, disconnected up there, and then you have got Russia here. Uh, um, um, uh, yeah. Uh, when one zooms in, it becomes uh, it becomes quite interesting, and, and actually um, we see some of the of the things that um, that are happening. On you you can't read the channel names here, but here we're basically at the border between Brazil and the um, and the English speaking world here and the Spanish speaking world here. I'm saying English speaking Spanish speaking world because actually this up there is is Spain and Mexico that mingle quite a bit, and also the U.S. and the U.K mingle quite a bit, right? So, so there is kind of a clear country structure there, but quite a bit of it is actually based on language rather than country. So if you have ever worked with, uh, with Gephi uh, in, um, with uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, data, you know that it's, this is really the limit of what you can do. So, so we've moved, and this is maybe an interesting tip for the programmers here. So we're moving to, uh, to this uh, library here, Graph Tool. It's a programming library, it's a, um, it's a C, it's written in C++, so it's very fast. It has a, a binary memory format, so you can, it, it, 
it allows for roughly between 10 to 100 times more data than, uh, than Gephi, um, but you have to uh, steer it uh, um, through, uh, through programming. And, and this is a way to then generate many more metrics, but it's, here we're really at the beginning. Kind of the last two things, uh, maybe those are currently just ideas where we want to go to. Um, we're particularly interested in things like controversiality. So what can we inject back? Which kind of variables can we generate? Controversiality, I'm using here Rebecca Black. You, anybody knows Rebecca Black? Yeah, fr Friday, there was a catchy tune. Well, it's, the, it's a, a, a video that has 3.6 million downvotes versus 1 million upvotes, right? And, and this is maybe a way that we can detect controversiality and we want to overlay controversiality with subject matter, right? So uh, one of our hypotheses here is a lot of YouTube channels thrive on controversiality. Controversiality is a means to construct and, uh, uh, and keep an audience, right? So can we do that? Another way is audience activation. I think it's very, very interesting. So for example, uh, Rebecca Black, she has uh, 1.4 million subscribers. But this video from three weeks ago only has 11,000 views, right? So that's, for example, a way that one can think is a channel able to basically address their own audience, you know, their, their own audience defined as subscribing to, uh, to them. So, so there are all kinds of like metrics that one can generate. And, and then maybe the most interesting thing to me and, 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 and maybe the most difficult is we want to try and operationalize like monetization tactics, strategies by analyzing the, the, um, the uh, video descriptions, right? For those of you who are um, YouTube users, you know that YouTube creators put a lot of like links, well, as you can see here, into, into the description of every video, right? Um, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, connecting to, uh, to social media. You have that here and you have that here, right? Um, but a lot of that actually connects to sites like Patreon, PayPal, um, uh, and then, for example, here, Gear. So that's from a tech channel, right? And it's a tech channel that basically gets a small commission for every sale that is being made when somebody you know, clicks on the links and then buys it, right? So, so this is something we've made some early attempts. One of the difficulties is that these are shortened links so we have to follow them, but this is, is relatively doable. Um, and then you can actually detect whether an Amazon link has an affiliate token there or, or not. So, so we would again kind of like connect stuff like categories, like countries, like topics with stuff like controversiality, but then also stuff like how is money being made? This is really kind of this critical media industries um, uh, perspective that comes in there, right? That these are I mean, some of them are, of course, ideological entrepreneurs, but uh, uh, very important also, um, uh, also the monetary element. And I think that's one of the reasons why YouTube is particularly interesting, right? There's serious money involved. Conclusion, my last slide, I, and I have an image. It's really nice. So, I mean, so, so this now was like a lot of different stuff, right? And I, I kind of like combined this kind of maybe like more humanities driven approach to, you know, kind of the technical side, how, how to deal with that, right? And then kind of maybe the more big data, data science stuff, right? That deals with audiences, deals with contents and so forth. And, and I feel I'm, we're in general with platforms, we're a little bit in this, in this situation. This is a famous uh, Chinese uh, parable, right? Of the, of the, the blind men who, um, who, 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 who touch the, the elephant and each one, so the person who touches the trunk thinks, ah, an elephant, an elephant is like a snake, right? The person who touches the ear says, ah, an elephant is like a towel, you know? The, the person who touches the, the tooth thinks, ah, it's like a spear and so forth, right? And, and kind of my like, kind of like weird um, attempt here is to, to do a little bit all of this together. <laughs> Uh, um, and to combine these lines of inquiry to, to get a bit closer to, to the elephant, right? So the elephant, which has its, its technical component, the elephant, uh, which has its, its interface, the, ele the elephant, which has, uh, um, you know, user communities, uh, and so forth. And that's it. Thanks a lot.
thanks so much for bringing so many dimensions together and also like for helping us to try and grasp this interface or intersection of actually theory uh, and practice. Also, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Please. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much. I think this was really insightful. And my question is more theoretical, and it, got, it relates a lot to Nick Calder's research. So um, it relates to your concept of assemblages of values. And to what extent would you agree with Caldry and Hebb that assemblages is a limited concept to analyze the power structures within the assemblages themselves? And if that's a criticism that Caldry gives to Latour, which I find really interesting. And it's when he brings the idea of figurations by Elias, claiming that figurations can actually allow us to detect this power logics, right? Because um, in a way, assemblages gives the same role to everything, uh, both objects and human action, whereas the objects do not have an intention back at us. So that is kind of my first question. To what extent do you agree or not that assemblages can be limited or unlimiting as well? Yeah. And the other theoretical question I have is the concept of value as well. And um, here you say that technology produces normativity and value statements. And is technology alone producing such normativity wh and in terms of who's giving value? When you give value to something, there's again like a power logic embedded in this idea of something being better than other, right? Um, and here is this perhaps challenging this notion of um, data is the new oil, but raw data is an oxymoron, right? And following us again, like Caldry's new research on data colonialism, um, and if we think of the analogy of data is the new oil, oil is found in nature, whereas data is not. So there is, again, this kind of, kind of, how can we foreground again the sociological thinking into this empirical, and the fantastic empirical work that you're doing and. Yeah, so more or less thinking about these assemblages of values. Yeah, so uh, those are really, really interesting questions. I mean, I probably take the term assemblage here kind of less from Latour, more from like the French context, right? Where, where, where heterogeneity is really an, an element that is part of it. So, so um, I mean, I agree with kind of, you know, Latour's idea that, that maybe, you know, from the outset we don't ascribe, uh, 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 you know, kind of different forms of agency to human and non-human actors. But, but then in a second step, maybe, you know, we have to, uh, we have to distinguish here. Um, and, and of course, kind of those power relations that, that I think, yeah, the, the work by, by, by Kodri and Mejias, I, I think um, is, is really interesting, right? So, so I'm, I'm definitely kind of inspired by that. But here we take a little bit of a step back in that research, particularly in that, f in that f uh, uh, first part, because, because a, a lot like very quickly jumps to the, the big things, right? Um, we get very quickly to something like surveillance capitalism, right? And, and maybe we have to, you know? Um, but here what we want to look at is actually more those moments when technology is being created. Um, and, and there I think, uh, you know, we have these kind of like power lines that obviously play a very important role. But, but one of the things that, that I'm going to maybe formulate it like very placated, like in a very, like, you know, a, a placative way, but computer science exists. It's, it's really a thing, right? Computer science is a real thing. It's, uh, it's, it's real knowledge. Those are real people who, who do things that, that, you know, are of course embedded within power structures, but there is a real substance to it. You know, there is a real, there is a real epistemology to it. And, and we want to highlight that, um, uh, uh, which then of course has to connect with the power element. Um, but but uh, your last question, you said, um, um, uh, the, uh, so the value statements, uh, so, so, so where, where does the value come from, right? Um, uh, uh, that then, you know, kind of makes, makes the, the technologies uh, performative. Um, of course, in part, it comes from those, you know, capitalistic settings, but in part, it comes also from an engineering tradition that has, that, you know, is, is of course not, not isolated, but that, that, you know, has really been constructed in a particular way and that also distributes value that isn't immediately monetary value, right? So, so if you will, there's also, I think, and one can think about this through a power lens, right? Computer science, for example, is a very gendered space. You know, there are all kinds of power structures within that space. 
But maybe to just to summarize, like I think we want to kind of kind of kind of bracket some of that stuff before it becomes too quickly the big the big things. You know, that's more like a micro micro thingy thing. You know. It, it, it really is, a, I mean, the, I, I think this is really something that I struggle with, right? Because um, a, a lot of, of what I say about technology comes from my own technical practice, right? Um, so that's a real source for me. It, it's, uh, it's, um, I, I don't think I have the mentality to do ethnographic research, right? Uh, to, uh, to go into a computer science lab and talk to the people, right? It's just not... It's just not my cup of tea, right? So, so, so a lot of that comes comes from that, right? Uh, comes from building software, comes from uh, applying machine learning, comes from comes from that. And and there's a real question how far this can go, right? But maybe that connects with the question before about precision. Um, so I'm not a social scientist, right? <laughs> so it's also I think I'm I'm fine with kind of launching that rather subjective probe into that space, right? Um, uh, and then, and then you know, kind of the the research that follows it uh, from it. Th there's then maybe other other voices, you know, that that that. But I, I kind of embrace that subjectivity, w you know, with with some hesitation. Yeah, that's a good question. The, the thing is, I don't distinguish. So f for me, like you know, I'm, pre I, you know, I might, I might just be fake. Uh, so, you know, I, the, the thing is, somebody wants to do something on those platforms, right? And they find means to do so. Um, when 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 Vivo makes an advertisement campaign for the art, is this then, you know, is this kind of buying subscribers? So so I, I absolutely get. I think it's a good question. But, but I think it's something to bracket um, and then to say, OK, so can we maybe uh, develop ways of actually kind of distinguishing between channels? And then maybe one category could be, you know, something that, oh, strange. They have very few videos. Those videos don't have a lot of views, but they have pretty, pretty many subscribers. How come? Right. So I would probably go about that way. Um, to really say like okay, uh, and, and then and then we can maybe make some cuts, right? Where we say what happens to the data if we leave that in? What happens when it comes out? The problem is quite simply that a lot of the data we just don't have. So for example, if uh, uh, very often, uh, and I think Jana knows much more about this uh, like I do than I do, um, but when when you know subscribers are being bought, you know, so, like you you have this kind of like big spike, and then you know, and for that we would have to look over time. And, and quite honestly, this, I mean, this data here is, is really, this is really, this is as far as I personally can go. This is like already way too much. This, like every time you just want to do some analysis takes hours. So, so, so doing that, you know, kind of like over time, but, but that would be great, but yeah. <laughs>
latest uh, internet governance forum. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this is really interesting, and, and I'm still a little bit under shock, right? Because I'm also not, you know, I'm, I'm not a legal scholar, I'm not, you know, so I'm, I have a similar impression. Uh, so I've, I've now, you know, been doing that for a couple of years, going to Brussels, and, 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 and I mean, the first thing that I, I noticed is that th there are quite different venues within these institutions. If, for example, you talk with the, with the commission, you mainly talk with technocrats, that are you know kind of like tasked with generating knowledge, right? And here you can really see that the commission lacks knowledge. There's a profound information asymmetry between the platforms and the regulators. So, and in order for the regulators to have to get the information that they need to regulate, they need to ask the platform providers for the data that then the regulators will use to regulate the platform providers. I mean, that doesn't sound like a very healthy situation, right? So, so, so that's kind of like part, part of the problem. I think the commission is profoundly, um, um, de I wouldn't say destabilized, but, but like in a moment where something big seems to have happened, which they have mostly approached through like an economic lens. And then like the whole fake news stuff happened, right? And then the whole, uh, you know, Trump election ha happened. And then the whole algorithm stuff happened. So I think they're currently really scuttling, really trying to like, oh, how can we generate knowledge? And, and, and then at the same time, you have the country actors. You have the, the council, right, who have, a, who have a much more, I mean, those are politicians. And they have a much more, like, I have to say, disturbing, like, agenda. It's like, I've never seen such a cacophony, cacophony of, uh, of, like, voices and, like, like, you know, going from we have to regulate everything to almost somebody literally saying, like, no states, no, we don't want that, right? So, so it's like a, a spectrum, and I'm, I'm baffled by that. I'm baffled by that, and, and um, my one response is to think about how could I be a bit of an ethnographer inside of that? Uh, and others, the other thing is, like, what can I, and, and I think the, this notion of observability, fighting for more data access, that's like now my, you know, my one thing. <laughs> the, the rest, I'm just, okay. <laughs> um, I was amazed to see uh, all this data that you collect from uh, YouTube. I was really curious if you ever thought of doing the same kind of diagram that Brother and his collaborators done mm -hmm. for the internet with this kind of data. Uh, not only in Brazil, when I talk about this, I say that kind of a candy, you know, graph, diagram, because you have a central point of it, that's where the candy yeah. is, and the other parts are just, you know, parts of a twisted candy. But, and the other thing that was thinking about, uh, do you think with your kind of methodology, you may be losing some kind of small isolates, like you have in the broader uh, mm -hmm. model, or they do not exist because of the algorithm part of YouTube, because they are not connected like links? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really interesting stuff. Uh, maybe I start with the first part. Th there's certainly stuff we're not getting. Um, I actually tried to run the crawl without any kind of cutoff, and the numbers were getting very quick, very, very rapidly uh, into a terrain where, you know, uh, just my small computer <laughs> can, 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 cannot deal. And, um, the, the, but the problem then is that, um, on YouTube, everybody's a channel, right? Every user is a channel. You put on one, one video, you're, you're a channel, right? Um, so, so I think the, the decision we made is to say, okay, we're, we're kind of dealing with that cutoff um, in, a, in a way that we focus more on the top, where we have more confidence. The, the problem is, I think, when you, get that, when you really try to get down into like all of those, you know, maybe, maybe like entrepreneurial uh, attempts to cheat, you know, or to, I don't know what to, you know, the, the, that, that question about faking. I think you need a different infrastructure. You need, you need a different, 
yeah, research setup. Um, and, and I think you will find something quite uh, quite also complicated to to deal with. So that's that's how I'm copying out from your uh, from your question. Um, we had to make that choice basically. Yes, but we had to make that choice. And and then the structure. I mean, I'm so so I haven't been able so far to, to plot like the whole 36 million because that's no longer possible in Gephi. Um, and even with graph tool, uh, it, it's probably running several days. Um, so, so I have to look into how to do that. My suspicion is that what's going to be particularly interesting is maybe not the structure in terms of, because one of the problems is for a lot of the channels, we don't get the subscribers, right? So there's this like hidden, hidden structure that, that we can't really get at. Um, and, and so that's, that makes me a little bit hesitant to talk about too much about that. But I think what we can get at, and that's going to be very interesting, I think is, is to try and juxtaposition the countries and the topics. Right? Because at first, at first glance, and that's the, the, the one thing that I showed, the, the, the country seems, to, the language seems to be very strong. But then to kind of see how we can kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of, you know, connect and disconnect that could be, uh, could be, could be very interesting. I'm not sure whether that, I mean, we'll, I, I think I'll try to do the, the bow tie thing. But first of all, I'm not sure whether I'm, I'll be able to. And, and then I'm not sure whether it's gonna what, what it's what's actually gonna say, you know, yeah. Because ultimately, it's not like the web, you know. There's something really quite different to the to YouTube, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I suppose, uh, unfortunately, now we have no time for even more uh, questions. But you uh, can talk to Bernhard. We all can talk to Bernhard during his uh, practical labs uh, on YouTube. Um, thank you again for to Bernhard and to Jeanne for this first uh, uh, session.